Hey, Bill, check out my new toy. I have this awesome camera right here. You want to take a selfie with me? Jebediah, you're always full of good ideas. Let's do it. Okay, ready? Three, two, one, say Kerbin. Okay, well, our facial expressions haven't changed, but I have a new brilliant idea. Let's take a space selfie or Kerbal selfie. Curfee. Let's take a curfee. Honest with Jebediah, I don't know where you get these ideas from, but they are awesome. Let's do it. And welcome to What the Math. Hello amazing viewer and welcome to What The Math. In today's video we're going to be talking about Explorer 6 mission, the mission that took the first picture of Earth from space. So you can call it Earth selfie or Earthy or basically it was just a normal picture of Earth. Now unfortunately the picture itself wasn't really good but nevertheless this was a pretty big achievement and this was sort of like a new race between Soviet Union and USA where they basically tried to take a snapshot of something in space using uh, cameras. Now, in the next video, we're going to be talking about the Soviet achievement, but in this video, we're going to talk about the United States of America and its space program, of course. Now, unfortunately, the early Explorer satellites weren't very that successful. As a matter of fact, Explorer 2 actually ended up catching fire and uh, was not able to reach orbit. Explorer 4 had a very difficult orbital launch, and so it ended up spinning a lot, and uh, there were a lot of failures with batteries, and Explorer 5 also crashed before reaching orbit. Lastly, the first Explorer 6 mission that was actually launched on top of Juno rocket also smacked back into our planet because it was not able to reach orbit. But nevertheless, USA was not giving up and then it came up with this new satellite called Explorer 6, also known as Explorer 6 S2 because this was the second version. And then on August 8th of 1959, they decided to launch this beautiful uh, satellite uh, on top of this beautiful rocket. So this was a Thor rocket as a first stage and then Able 3 rocket as a second stage. Able 3 was a derivative of an earlier design from Vanguard rockets, which was relatively more successful than, than the ones that they used on Juno rockets, which were the ones that failed previously. Now, so this was a two-stage uh, launch and basically the Thor stage would take it to the higher atmosphere and then uh, the upper stage stage would separate and would proceed to reach orbit. And the satellite itself was a relatively small spherical shaped satellite, kind of similar to Sputnik in a sense, except that this also had four extendable uh, panels that had solar batteries and solar panels attached to them. It also had quite a lot of scientific equipment on it. Uh, it had something to study um, radiation belts uh, around Earth. It also had something to study galactic cosmic rays, geomagnetism or magnetism of our planet and uh, radio wave propagation in the upper atmosphere. And of course, it also wanted to study more micrometeorite collisions. And lastly, it also had a little camera, a black and white camera that would snap a picture of Earth and then transmit it back to Earth using antennas. And each of these experiments that it was going to perform in space had two outputs, uh, digital and analog outputs. And it was able to transmit a lot of the information on a TV-like signal that uh, was used back in the days. And then they also had a, a radio transmitter, a VHF transmitter, that was basically transmitting a lot of the analog uh, data. And all of this was meant for it to basically transmit all of the scientific findings uh, using two different frequencies so that we could actually receive more data. Now, when the satellite was launched, it was actually launched in a very, very elliptical orbit, which is why you see me going pretty much up uh, without really any gravity turn here. And its orbit was 237 kilometers periapsis by 42,000 kilometers apoapsis. So this is a very, very highly elliptical orbit. And so we're gonna try to recreate this in Kerbal Space Program as well. And basically this allowed this craft to study uh, Earth magnetism and a lot of radiation around Earth using low orbit but then also high orbit. So it was able to basically pass by all of those regions around Earth. But despite this highly elliptical orbit, uh, the satellite's orbit actually decayed on July 1st, 1961, so only about after two years. And after about 827 hours of transmission, it uh, crashed back into our planet and disappeared. 
But just like so many early satellites, it of course had some problems as well. One of the problems was that its uh, solar panels uh, started to extend a little bit earlier than they should have and one of them got stuck. So only three of the solar panels were, were being deployed and unfortunately this didn't provide enough energy. So. So the satellite only functioned at about 63% of the actual power supply and this also meant that uh, it couldn't really perform all of the experiments the way they should have been performed. But nevertheless, the satellite was still quite successful in transmitting quite a lot of data back to Earth. It used two different frequencies, it used uh, both analog and digital transmissions, and of course it was able to snap a shot of Earth, which you see right here, which is really not that impressive, but you know what, this is a first picture, so don't judge. And uh, it was then able to transmit this picture back to, back to our planet without really sending any kind of film or anything to to us, which was uh, what uh, US was doing before. A lot of the satellites that they used before this, specifically the, the spy satellites that I talked about in the previous part, uh, were using film. The film had to be returned back to the planet and this was the only way we could receive those pictures, but this time we actually used antennas to transmit the picture back to our planet. In other words, this was the beginning of the digital transmission through space. But then also in 1959, the satellite was actually the first to be used in a kind of an interesting anti-satellite mission. The so-called Bold Orion missile, which is actually an anti-satellite missile, passed within 6 kilometers of this satellite just to see uh, what these rockets were capable of. And this missile was launched from a B-47 uh, aircraft uh, at an altitude of about 11,000 meters or about 35,000 feet. And then it would try to uh, reach orbit and then try to intercept Explorer 6 satellite passing within about 4 miles or 6.4 kilometers. And so if this missile had a nuclear capability or nuclear warhead and exploded uh, close to the satellite, it would then basically take it out and the satellite would be gone. So in other words, this bold Orion test was actually quite successful. And this of course gave US a lot of confidence in that it was able to shoot down any kind of satellite from the Soviet Union uh, without much trouble. And I think this is a good summary of what this mission was able to achieve and accomplish. Essentially, uh, Explorer 6 was a stepping stone to future satellites which would also use a lot of solar panels and would also be able to transmit data directly to Earth without sending anything back such as, you know, for example, film or anything else so that we could now actually transmit any kind of findings directly back using both digital and analog transmissions. But of course, Soviets had something else in mind, and we're going to be talking about this mission in the next part. Anyway, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video, and hopefully you will subscribe and like this video as well. If you enjoy Kerbal Space Program videos, or if you enjoy learning about history of spaceflight, check out these videos right here. And of course, there's more videos coming. Every week I'll be releasing at least one of these, so that you get to learn a little bit more about history of spaceflight. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, and I'll game you later. Bye-bye.